one of the responsibilities of a true leader being someone who develops and, 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 uh, and trains and prepares the next generation of leaders uh, for, uh, for service. Joshua servant leadership, uh, or Joshua the servant leader. Um, the first time that, that, that I ever ran across this phrase, servant leadership, um, came from a, an essay that was written in, in uh, 1970. And it was written by a man by the name of, of uh, Robert Greenleaf, who wrote an essay uh, entitled Servant Leadership. And that kind of caught on in terms of, of what was happening in the world in the, in the, in the 70s. Um, being a servant leader became something to aspire to. Uh, and I'm talking not just about churches and religious organizations, but I'm also talking about uh, communities, uh, companies, corporations. Um, and so it became something that, that, uh, that, that uh, good leaders wanted to aspire to. And then that kind of fell away. Um, but again, in 2001, James Autry wrote a book primarily for the business world entitled The Servant Leader and was followed up by a book uh, in 2003 by Ken Blanchard. Uh, Ken and his wife Marjorie, um, um, probably very well known in the consulting and training industry across the country. Uh, Ken wrote numerous books and, and, and um, um, his wife Marjorie was, was, his, um, was his partner, um, good friends of mine, and, and, and um, I really appreciated uh, the stuff that they did. And, um, still doing, uh, for that matter, the company that, that they started. Um, but he wrote a book called The Servant Leader. And then uh, just um, a couple of years ago, uh, Walter Kaiser Jr., kind of interesting enough, looked at exactly the topic that we're looking at today, and he talked about Joshua, a true servant leader. And so it was made it kind of interesting to me to say, okay, I've talked about servant leadership in in my professional life for, for a number of years, uh, how does that play out? How does that compare to what Kaiser said in, in, in his, uh, uh, his book, uh, Joshua, A True Servant Leader? Um, and so I, I took a look at that this week and, and uh, a couple of other articles that, that have been written in recent years about uh, Joshua and his servant leadership. Uh, and I want to share some of that information with you this morning and some other stuff that, 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 that I kind of came up with. But, there, but, but by and large, there are seven concepts, seven ideas, seven characteristics that um, people have identified um, as being characteristics of a servant leader. Uh, and these characteristics are characteristics that Joshua had. And so we're going to look at them as an examples um, and I've detailed them there in, in the handout that, that you have. And we're not going to go over this first one a lot, but, but I'll just mention it one more time. We've talked about this two or three times, because the first chapter, uh, the very first week that we taught this class, you know, my question was, and my, my interest in talking about, was this, this whole issue of can someone command you to have courage? Well, obviously, um, in this chapter, God commanded Joshua four times to have courage, to be strong and courageous. Um, and I think we're tempted oftentimes to think uh, of a servant leader, uh, certainly a servant, as someone who's timid, who, who's quiet, who's kind of unassertive. Um, that, that was not necessarily the case uh, when you look at the leaders that, that God appointed uh, to the children of Israel. Moses certainly was not that way. Joshua was not that way. Uh, others that, that uh, followed them were not that way. Um, but putting someone else first does not necessarily equal being passive or insecure. And oftentimes it, it shows a sense of strength, that I am comfortable enough with my position, I am comfortable enough with, with uh, my thoughts, my ideas, that I'll ask you for your opinion. I'll put you first. Uh, I will try to serve you, to encourage you, to, to enhance your success. Um, so servant leaders kind of take a different perspective than, than, than some other leaders. You know, if you think about, about what we look for in leadership, 
Um, you know, I think of the military world where you, you have a, a, a successful leader is one who takes charge of, of his, his command and charges a hill to capture that hill. You think of a, of a politician who is, so, is very sure of himself and, 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 and commands the entire, um, as the commander in chief, the entire country. Someone who is out there in front all the time, uh, putting himself on a pedestal or herself on a pedestal. Uh, that's kind of what we think about in terms of leadership, someone who's the focus of everyone's attention. That wasn't Joshua. You know, that, that, that wasn't necessarily the way, the way Joshua dealt with these things. So in, maybe, that, maybe Joshua's own natural inclination was to kind of be in the background and to serve and to help and to encourage and to support. And if that was, that was the case, then no wonder in this first chapter that God told him four different times, be strong and courageous, be very strong and courageous. So in verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, and verse 18, you've got that, uh, that, that uh, command that, that, he, um, uh, that he gives. And I think that, that the, the bottom line here is that when we trust God and we feel comfortable uh, in our relationship with God, it frees us to be strong and courageous because we know it's not all up to us you know I, I i can recall on a couple of occasions in my life when 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 things were really down i mean i, you know, I felt like i'd i'd failed at something and 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 had no idea of how i was going to fix what i'd gotten myself into and you know maybe i was driving down the road and, and said god you got this i don't know what to do and so when we place our, uh, uh, our lives in God's hands, it gives us, it frees us to be strong and to be courageous and to, um, um, uh, to operate in a way that, that a true servant leader could operate. So the first characteristic that we're looking at here is a true servant leader is one that should be strong and courageous. So let's look at the second characteristic of a leader. The second characteristic of a servant leader is putting your faith and trust into God. Putting your faith and trust in God. Following God's word. Following God's command. So in Joshua, the first chapter, in the seventh verse, the seventh verse, it says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. So putting your faith in God means not turning to the right or to the left, not deviating from the commands uh, that, that God has, has given us. In Numbers, the 13th chapter, in the 25th through the 28th verse, uh, Richard talked about that a couple of weeks ago, um, when the 12 spies were sent into to the land of Canaan um, and came back, you know, spies are i would think would be fairly brave people i mean they're people who go into an enemy land and look around see what's going on uh try to kind of stay in the background so they're not seen and then they leave that area and they come back and they report to their commanders well the spies 12 of them went into the land of canaan and came back and 10 of them said oh no we can't do that those people are giants in that land um we have no chance of doing that but two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, were faithful and believed with God's help we could take the land. Caleb specifically said that, uh, that we can, with God's help, God will give us this land. And then if you look at Joshua, the sixth chapter, the first through the fifth verses, certainly there around uh, verse two, the whole fall of Jericho. And I mentioned this uh, three or four weeks ago. You know, if I'm, a, if I'm a military commander and um, I've got this huge army um, and here's a very fortified city and I'm going to have to take that fortified city and somebody tells me, okay, Stacy, I want you to march around that city once every day with your entire army and on the seventh day, I want you to march around it six times and blow the horn and yell and you'll be good to go. I said, okay. <laughs> You know, I, I, 
that, that had to require great, great faith. Because without a shot being fired, without an axe being swung, or a sword being withdrawn from the sheath, they were going to take the, the city of Jericho. Because they had faith and trust in God. I would that in my life, I would have that kind of faith. Because it had, that had to, to require uh, amazing faith. And then in the 8th chapter of Joshua, if you've got, you got your Bible, look up at the, the 35th uh, verse. It says, There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. So what you see here is that Joshua in his life conveyed what Moses had commanded, what God had given to Moses, and he continuously shared that with the children of Israel. Now, I, it's been said and been numbered that the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, uh, there were two million of men. Two million men. I don't know, that, that's, a, that's a bunch of people. Um, you know, and I, I can't imagine envisioning that um, the movie, The Ten Commandments, had a tough time depicting it because it wasn't two million people crossing that Red Sea when you saw that. But, uh, but I, but I have, a, have a tough time thinking about that. Think of two million people. That's more than the entire city of, of, of Tam entire area of Tampa Bay. Two million people coming out of bondage, walking across the Red Sea on dry land, entering and wandering around that wilderness, you know, I, I know the size of the area. It's a sizable area. But, uh, you know, you put two million men plus women and children in that group, and you got four or five million people wandering around in the wilderness and God feeding them with manna for, 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 uh, for 40 years. Um, and then they come to the Jordan River and cross the Jordan River. Five million people. Um at least, if you had one child per family. Uh, and they had, I'm sure they had more than that. But conservatively, five million people. I just cannot envision what that looked like to see this mass of people moving um, across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. But the, the, but, the, but the key thing here is the reason they were able to do that is because they had faith in what God had told them. He told them they could leave the land of Egypt. He had told them they could cross the Red Sea. He told them when they wandered around, he'd feed them. He told them they could get across the Jordan River. And here they go. Now, interestingly enough, how did the children of Israel oftentimes react to these movements? What did they do? And Ron's got a, a microphone here. If you, They rejected it, wanted to go back to their... Uh, home in, in Egypt. Yeah, that, you know, can, can you think about it? You know, I'm thinking if, if, you know, if I were a member of that, that nation and I had seen uh, the plagues and I had seen the crossing of the Red Sea and I had seen being fed in, with my own eyes, yet when something came up, well, it would be better if we were back in Egypt. Um, I, I question their faith that they would have in God. But this verse says, in Joshua 8, 35, he says continually, he said, every, he told everything that Moses had told him, he told that to the men, he told that to the women, he told that to the children, he even told that to the people that just happened to be there that weren't part of the nation of Israel. So that they would have faith in what God and uh, had, had told them and trust uh, in his promises. So that to me is a second characteristic of a true leader. Faith and trust in God. The third one is one that corporate America has adopted. Um, almost every model of leadership that you look at in corporate America talks about um, one of the responsibilities of a true leader being someone who develops and, 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 uh, and trains and prepares 
the next generation of leaders uh, for, uh, for service. And so, did Joshua do that? Well, in the first chapter again, in the fifth verse, back up there in the fifth verse a little bit, it says, um, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The point I think he's making here is that Moses led you effectively. God was with him. I will be with you. And those after me are going to that have faith and trust in God. They will be able to, to, to lead you. They will not forsake you. They will take care of you. Uh, in, in the fourth chapter, fourth chapter and the... 20, 21st verse. One of the, the commandments there to them said, He said to the Israelites, In the future when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? This is when they went across the Jordan River and they, they piled up the 12 stones as a memorial. Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. So I think the key part of that verse is, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers. So he's not just looking about getting across the Jordan River. He's telling them, hey, here's a memorial. This means something. This is, beyond, this is part of our history. This is part of what God has done for us. So let's remember that, and let's tell your descendants, let's tell your children that God supported us, God took care of us. In the 23rd chapter, in the 6th verse, Therefore be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book and the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor the left. So he continued to tell those who were under his control that he commanded. He continued to tell them, We have the law of Moses. Let's communicate that. Let's tell people about God's relationship that we have with him. And let's not let that go away. Let's not lose sight of that. Um, in the 24th chapter, in the 31st verse, that, not the 21st verse as it says, but in the 31st verse, all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. So those who were after Joshua carried that same message. Those who outlived him. So it seems to me that he had some success, probably pretty good success, in preparing the next generation of leaders. You know, the, the sad thing is, if, if you have a strong leader, and it's all about that person, um, maybe they've got a big ego, maybe they, you know, whatever it is, um, when you have a very strong leader and all the attention is on that leader, then what happens when that leader departs? You know, I think in, in many cases you've seen in, in history, a void occurs and the group that is left leaderless, you know, it has a weakness. But effective leaders prepare those people who will follow them. That's why you do training. That's why you have leadership development programs. You know, there, there, there's uh, several years ago, I was, I was in a continually, in fact, a few weeks ago, I taught a class on leadership to, to Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And, um, you know, I, I, I Googled leadership. And... Um, when you look at, sometimes when you Google leadership, it'll give you the number of hits, the number of items that Google finds on the internet about leadership. And I don't know there's anything that there's more written about leadership. Because in, 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 in that, when I Googled it, it was 37 million hits came up. And so I told the class that day, I said, I, I Google leadership and 37 million hits came up and I thought a good use of our time today would be looking at each one of those one at a time to see what it said about leadership. Well, you can't, can't do that. But because there were so many hits, that must be on the minds 
of people who are struggling to run organizations. Where does our leadership come from? What does it look like? How do we do this? And if you don't prepare the next generation and they walk into it, I'll, I'll never forget to, um, if you um, are old as I am, there was a movie that came out probably back in the 70s, 70s or 80s, starred Robert Redford, and it was called The Candidate. Um, some of you may have seen that. If you, if you haven't, I think you'd find it interesting, certainly with our, with our times today. But in The Candidate, Robert Redford is a, is a young man, uh, very charismatic, no experience, and um, he gets tabbed to be the candidate for president for one of the political parties. Not even, I don't remember which one. But he is handled. They tell him how to dress. They tell him how to comb his hair. They tell him how to speak. They tell him what to say. Everybody's telling him all this stuff. And, and he, he's, a good, he's a good learner. He's a quick learner. He can learn this stuff. He can memorize it. And he says what they tell him to say, and he looks like he tell, they tell him to look, and he goes where they tell him to go. Oh, what do I do next? Okay, let's go here. Let's do that. Let's do this. Let's say this. Let's say that. Election night comes, and he wins the election. And I'll never forget one of the last scenes in that movie. Is it's on him, and he's excited, and then the expression on his face changes, and the camera comes back, and he looks up at his handler and says, what do I do now? What do I do now? So in that case, just a symbolic case, but wasn't prepared for leadership. Wasn't prepared to take the reins and do what needed to be done. What do I do now? Right? I think there's some comparison to uh, when East Germany was, uh, when the wall came down, and, and their uh, work ethic and so forth, they, they didn't know much about anything other than the one thing that they were told to do. And so they were, uh, I don't know if they were easily led, but they had to be led to get anything done. And that, it kind of reminds me of Joshua being the good shepherd over all these people that you're talking about in comparison to Jesus as the good shepherd and and his flock. <clears throat> Hang on to that because we're going to talk about that in just two <laughs> minutes. That's a good, good observation. You're exactly right. You know, when you think of times when, when nations have been freed, there is a time after that they don't really know what to do. And so we've coined a phrase, nation building, uh, that the, our country has been involved with over the past 15 or 20 years, where in some cases we have helped free a nation but we have to stay there. We have to say, here's how you run an election. Here's how you build an organization. Here's how you lead your people so that they have some sense of how to move forward. If not, they like the children of Israel. Hey, it was better the way it used to be. Let's go back to the way we had it. And it's interesting because sometimes the known is better than the unknown. Sometimes we know what we had in Egypt. We know how that was. We know what we had even when God was feeding us in the wilderness and we wandered around for 40 years. That was better than not knowing. Sometimes we fear, fear the unknown. So preparing that, that next generation uh, of leaders. Then the other, next characteristic I want to take just a, a minute to talk about is humility. Um... I think Joshua exhibited that for two reasons. One is he was willing to serve for 40 years under Moses. Um, I don't know too many people who take a job and don't expect to get promoted for 40 years. Have any of you ever been happy with that? <laughs> you took a job, got no promotion for 40 years, that, that's probably not... We don't expect that. Um, so he served for 40 years uh, under Moses. And the second reason I think he had great humility was that oftentimes when he talked to the children of Israel, it wasn't, this is what I'm saying. 
He says, this is what Moses said, or this is what God is saying to us. This is what our Lord is saying to us. And he is channeling that. He's, he's the vehicle of communication for what Moses said or what God said. I don't remember one time in the entire book that he says, I believe this. I'm saying this. And so that, that to me, um, gives a sense of, uh, that he had humility, he had great humility. In the third chapter, the, the seventh verse, and in the 14th chapter, in the 14th verse, he actually, he actually uses the phrase magnified by God. Here's a, here's a message that is magnified by God. God makes this important. Because I'm saying it doesn't make it important. God says it, and that's why it's important. In the 23rd chapter, in the 3rd verse, and the 10th verse of that, of that same chapter, um, he makes the statement, And you have seen all that the Lord our God has done to all these nations for your sake. And Joshua's a great commander. He's organized the tribes. He's led them. He's, given the, he's communicated with them. He is the leader. But he didn't say, here's what I've done. He said, here's what the Lord our God has done to all of these nations for your sake. And if you remember when they were talking about the battles of, in, in Joshua, we're talking about the battles that the children of Israel had, it actually said when they had these, in one case, I think five kings, and in another case, 31 kings that they were fighting, these 31 kings had soldiers as numerous as sands on the seashore. That's a lot of soldiers. But he says here, God delivered those to you. I, it wasn't him. I didn't do it. God did this for, 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 for the children of Israel. In Joshua, the fourth chapter and the 14th verse, the Lord is the one who exalted Joshua. Says, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him. Not because of what he said, not because of what he did. I think it was because of how he acted personally in his leadership role. Recognizing that he was serving the children of Israel and he was serving God in all that he did. And in the fifth chapter, the 13th through the 15th verse, it speaks about Joshua being willing to serve one greater than himself recognizing that there is one who is greater than himself. Um, sometimes when we have great success in our life, um, we think, um, look what I did. I've been very successful. I mean, you get a promotion, you make a lot of money, you buy a new house, you buy a new car, whatever it is. Look what I did. Um... Joshua always gave God the glory. And I think that one of the greatest attributes, and it's something that, 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 that I haven't always done, but I've always hoped I would do, is when those great successes come, it's pausing for a moment and saying, thank you. I didn't do this by myself. So to me, great characteristic of a servant leader is humility, giving glory uh, to God. Now here's one we're not really used to seeing in our country. Uh, when we look at our leaders, um, leaders keep their promises. Um, it's not always easy to keep your promise, is it? I remember when my kids were growing up. One of my daughters would come to me and say, Hey, Dad, can we? No, I promise you, we'll do that tomorrow. Tomorrow comes and everything gets busy and it's and I got all these things happening and I didn't know what were going to happen today and you really had to concentrate and think, hey, I promised them we'd do that today. And so keeping your promise as a father, as a mother, as a leader, keeping your promises. Sometimes when it's not all that convenient. And so one of the examples I looked at here was in Joshua the ninth chapter in the nineteenth and the twentieth verses. When he talked to the Gibeonites, anybody remember that story? 
you know, they kind of tried to pull a trick. You know, let's, let's, children of Israel, we want to negotiate with you. We want to live in, in, in harmony with you. We don't want to uh, we don't want to have these wars. We know you're defeating all these people. We want to be part of this, and um, we're not really who you think we are. And, and so they have this conversation, and, and, um, and, and so Joshua promises them, uh, we're not going to touch you. We'll let you live. And then come to find out they are the enemy. So what could Joshua have done? Well, hey, you lied to us, so we're going to wipe you out. But in the 19th to the 20th verse of, of, of the ninth chapter, he says, he tells his, his commanders, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. I think one of the greatest attributes of an effective leader, whether it's a corporate leader, a parent, a church leader, whoever it is, community leader, civic leader, whatever. Do what you say you will do. Um, I saw that uh, in my dad several times. When I was growing up, he was, he was a minister and uh, kind of my hero, and the older I get, the greater a hero he was. <laughs> um, but... Um, there were times when he would, he would go see someone who, who had a family member that was really ill. And he would tell, they would say, Charlie, when, we want you to do the, we want you, if the, when so-and-so passes, we want you to do this, I'll be here, I'll do that. And life would extend on for a while. And maybe, I remember occasions, we would be, we'd go to Scottsville, Kentucky, two or three hours away to, uh, to visit my grandparents, and they'd get a call while we were there. So-and-so's passed away, and we're going to have the funeral tomorrow or the next day. We'd load up in the car and head back. Our vacation was over. And my mom would say, can't you let somebody else do that? Can't you let so... I told them I would be there. I told them I would do this. Do what you say you will do. It's a simple phrase, but it is so difficult for leaders to keep their promises, for parents to keep their promises, for friends to keep their promises. We just explained it away. Well, something else came up. I know I told you I'd be there, but, but something came up. Something's always going to come up. So Joshua had that characteristic. But I think the ultimate, the ultimate example of that occurs in Luke, the 23rd chapter, and the 24th verse, when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, Jesus had made a promise. God had made a promise to send his son, die on the cross. You know, I can, I can imagine what Jesus could have felt at that time. Blaming and pointing a finger. And, I mean, he could have called down angels and moved, removed himself from that cross. But he endured that for us because of the promise. The promise of heaven. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So leaders keep their promises. The next one of these says, take the side of the Lord, take the side of truth. Uh, that doesn't always happen either. Oftentimes you see leaders manufacture truth. You take financial reports from a company and you interpret them one day while they can't, should be interpreted some other way because you want to do something. I think oftentimes we have a tendency to believe that the world kind of revolves around us. But a great servant leader knows that's not the case. And so in chapter 5, when you have the children of Israel conquering the city of Jericho, it's not about how Joshua would have approached that battle. It's what God told them to do. So he took the side of God. In the first chapter, in the eighth verse, it talks about Joshua's way of life and how he me mediated, on, meditated, talked about, thought about 
God's word day and night. In the 12th and 15th verse, that same, um, same chapter when they're getting ready to, to, to cross uh, uh, the Jordan River, where he talks to the children of Israel about the responsibility they have and the tribes. He's taking the side of the Lord. God has given him that message and he's communicating that. And finally, in the 8th chapter, in the 30th to the 35th verse, where he renews the covenant. God had a covenant, first of all, with who? Anybody remember the first covenant God established was with who? Abraham. Abraham, exactly. And that covenant gets renewed uh, at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, where the covenant that he had with Abraham is renewed. That the children of Israel are a chosen people, and he's giving them this land, this land of, of Canaan. So Joshua came down on the side of the Lord. He came down on the side of truth, and it wasn't always convenient. It wasn't always easy. There were some pretty big obstacles out there in front of him. You know, you look at, at some of the, I can't imagine having four or five million people behind me and I'm about to cross the Jordan River and you back the water up on one side and you walk across on dry land um, but there's 36 kings and there are nations arrayed in front of you that's a pretty big challenge and Joshua came down on the side of truth okay, our next to the last characteristic because I want to get to that last slide um, Choose and act. Yes. I just I have something on my mind I wanted to ask you. Okay. Somewhere back in ancient history I was studying this subject and I read, I don't remember where, but the uh, archaeologists that were searching for the ancient city of Jericho uh, discovered it and found that the walls had fallen inward. Have you ever heard that? I have. Uh, and I've been to the ancient city of Jericho. I can't vouch for that. And I couldn't tell whether they'd fallen inward or outward, but, but, um, uh, but they fell. <laughs> um, it would seem logical to kill more people if they fell yeah, that way. Yeah. But I couldn't find it, to the best of my recall, in the Scripture. <laughs> I can't confirm it, but, but I have heard it. So... Choose and then act, the last, the seventh characteristic of, of a servant leader, and then we'll look at, um, at, at a, a comparison here. I think good leadership, and, I, and, I, and I've looked at a lot of, a lot of um, uh, models of leadership because I have to choose what I want to tell corporate America when I go and, and work with them. Um, but one of them, I think, is a very simple model of leadership um, that was created by, by a, a publication by the Wiley Corporation, same people that that, that published the books for dummies. Some of you may have some of those. Um, maybe this is leadership for dummies. I don't know, but it's simple to me. And that is that effective leaders have a vision. Effective leaders align their resources to support that vision. And effective leaders execute. So Joshua prepared. He had this vision while he was working under Moses. God had given the promised land. There's the vision. He's promised them that's going to be yours. He organized the tribes of Israel. And they marched from uh, the wilderness across the Jordan River to take the land. And they conquered Canaan. Vision, alignment, and execution. And I think one of the greatest characteristics, one of the things that, that's kind of a... a, a makes me say that Joshua was a stalwart. I mean, I mean, he was solid. He was a solid leader. It's because of the verse that we started with seven weeks ago in the 24th chapter in the 14th verse, the uh, 14th, 15th verse, in the latter part of that verse, when it says, Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If we could do that, I think we'd be, hey, we're in, we're in high cotton. We're great. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So flip that sheet over and look at the back page because I want to spend the last, I only have about three minutes here. 
But I want to spend the last three minutes looking at something that I thought was kind of interesting. There are, there are, there are some real c- comparisons, if you will, between Joshua and Jesus that I think are, are very favorable comparisons. We, re- we recognized last week, Joshua's not a perfect man, but there are some comparisons that compare favorably with Jesus. Number one, the name is the same. If you look at the, uh, the la- Hebrew language, Joshua means Savior. If you look at the Greek language, Jesus means Savior. Joshua was a leader of Israel into the promised land. Jesus is our leader into heaven. John 14, chapter in the first verse. John pointed the people to the work of God. Matthew 7, 21 tells us Jesus did the same thing. And both were an agent of grace and an agent of damnation. Joshua was an agent of grace as he dealt with Rahab. But damnation, when he slayed the kings, the 36 kings that he faced um, in, in, uh, as he, as he uh, conquered Canaan. And Jesus is both a savior and a judge. Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 34th through the 41st verse. So there are some comparisons that you can make, very favorable comparisons between Joshua and Jesus. And so I think it's been beneficial. I appreciate him more after having studied the book of Joshua over the last seven weeks. I certainly appreciate his, him and his role that he had in leading the children of Israel out of the, um, the wilderness into the promised land. His role as a leader, as a commander of vast armies, uh, his grace and his humility, uh, and his consistent belief and trust that God was there and God was with him. You know, we could just have that. Consistent belief in trust. God is here, God is with us. Shaq uses the phrase, God's got this. <laughs> if we could just have that as a part of how we approach life, I think we'd be doing all right. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your attendance over the last seven weeks.